It's a real pleasure to have Brother Perry Hall and his wife, and his wife Lorraine with us in this uh, lectureship program. It's been my pleasure to know Perry and Lorraine for a number of years. And Perry is just the kind of guy that just captures you right away, not only because of the fact that he's good looking, but because of the fact that he is, uh, he just demonstrates an attitude, an aura of sincerity, of straightforwardness, and the fact that he believes in and stands for and proclaims the truth of God's word. He began preaching in 1955, attended uh, Fort Worth Christian and Abilene Christian University, University of Texas at Arlington and Dallas Baptist. He's worked with uh, a number of congregations in Texas, spent five years in the mission field in Wisconsin. He's traveled extensively in the European, Asian, and African uh, countries. 19 of those countries involved uh, with Bible land slides used in, uh, in his preaching. He's conducted many, many gospel meetings. He's very popular in that area. He's called on a great deal for gospel meetings and lectureships such as this. He's done a lot of writing for our periodicals, and he is presently the pulpit minister for the University Church in Tyler, Texas. Perry's going to be speaking to us this morning on the subject, Abraham's Seed, Heirs According to the Promise. My pleasure to present to you Brother Perry Hall. It is a genuine joy to be here this morning with my wife, Lorie, and from the, with these brothers and sisters from Tyler, Texas, who have traveled so far this morning to give me their support and their encouragement, as they've been doing now for a number of years. We love them very deeply, and we're all so very thankful to be here on this occasion. Coming over, Lorie and I were talking about this privilege that I've been granted and I said, you know, this is really the first time that I've been asked to preach on the Fort Worth Lectures, even though I taught uh, five years as an area preacher on occasion in classes at the Brown Trail School of Preaching. But she reminded me that I had been asked as a young preacher about 26 or 27 years ago to fill in for Brother Leroy Brownlow when he got sick one year, and that was at the Fort Worth Christian College Lectures. He had worked up the talk and the book had been printed and it came down the last few days before the lectureship and he got ill and I stood in his place and preached. And so I figure that after 26 or 27 years of preparation, I'm very, very glad to be here. <laughs> and uh, that means that the next time I'll ask, it'll be 2015 and I'll just be in my 80s, but I'll be raring to go, brother. <laughs> <laughs> But it is a joy to be here with this wonderful congregation that we've greatly loved and appreciated over the years, the School of Preaching, Brother Eddie Whitten, the elders of this congregation. They've meant so much to us over the years. They've been a great encouragement to us. And so I am very, very appreciative of this opportunity. Beloved, there is nothing more amazing than the amazing grace of God. We have seen that this week. It ought to be apparent to all of us by now that God is resolutely determined in keeping with man's free moral agency to bring sons into glory to save our souls from sin. Nothing is clearer in a study of God's word than this grand and glorious fact. Time after time, God has borne patiently with a people that merited only to be taken and destroyed. But over and over again, God in his mercy marched through the ages to make his plan effective. The Hebrew writer had something to say about the effort of God in Hebrews chapter 2, and verse 9 he said, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, 
crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons into glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And skipping on down to verse 14, the writer said, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he likewise himself became partaker of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all of their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not upon himself the nature of angels, but of the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a mer made a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Now in this introductory passage, we see God's grace. We see man's need. We see the incarnate seed of Abraham being perfected in death to become the savior of the world, the redeemer of mankind. All of this in order to bring many sons into glory. We will see in our study this morning the great promise of God and the efforts that he's made to make us his spiritual children in order that he might make us heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Along with unsurpassed privilege, however, will go indeed great responsibilities. And if we have time, we want to touch upon some of these marvelous things. The heart of our study will be taken from passages in the Roman epistle and also the Galatian epistle with emphasis on Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. Here Paul says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now in this passage that we shall zero in later in our study, we find the promise of an inheritance. But we know that a promise is determined in value primarily by the one who does the promising, not by what is promised. If we cannot trust the one who gave the promise, the promise has no value at all. Now this promise was given by Abraham's God, who spoke to Moses several years after Abraham had passed from the scene in the burning bush of Mount Sinai and said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham. Exodus 3 and verse 6. Moses goes on to reveal in the first five books of the Bible the fact that Abraham's God was the creator of the universe, the one true and living God, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, immutable, and perfect in all of his attributes. The Hebrew writer, speaking of these great promises that were given to Abraham, and urging Christians on to greater diligence, wrote in Hebrews 6, 13 through 20, For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise for men, Verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them, an end, to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope which is set before us, which hope we have as an anchor to the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered, 
even Jesus. Now the God of the promise is the Father of lights. James says, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow that is cast by a turning. And because he could swear by no greater, as one who could not lie, he swore by himself. And so the promise that God gave cannot fail. He cannot lie, for he is not a man that he should lie. Numbers 23 and 19. And so the God of promise is therefore trustworthy, and it behooves us then to look at the promise. And so as heirs of God, we look at the call of Abraham and the promise that was given unto him. Destined to be the friend of God and the father of the faithful, God called Abraham originally from Ur of Chaldea, from the midst of idolatry. And in this call was given exceeding great and precious promises. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now as we seek to analyze this passage of scripture, which was indeed repeated several times in promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the centuries, we find there are several things that are involved within it. There is a physical side and there is a spiritual side. There would be a physical seed that would be given to Abraham that would produce a physical nation, which it in turn would have an inheritance that was physical, the land of Canaan. But of greater importance than this physical nation and the physical promises that were given was the fact that out of this physical nation would arise the spiritual side of the promise, a spiritual seed or offspring that would be indeed the begetter of a spiritual nation, the church, the kingdom of the living God, which would be accompanied by spiritual inheritance, heaven itself. And so the physical side of the promise included only the nation of Israel, the Jews, the physical seed, the nation, and the land promises have been totally fulfilled. And the blessings of the spiritual seed, the spiritual nation, and the inheritance continue to be fulfilled this morning, even under this very hour. And so this caused us to press on with Abraham and with the promise and we look at Abraham's obedient faith. Now on the human side, the obedient faith of Abraham became the grounds of his acceptance or justification before God. Now it's, under, it's very important that we understand this because both Paul and James point out to us that the basis of our own justification before God, our being children of Abraham, and heirs, according to the promise, lie in this same kind of response to God and to his commands that was given by Abraham. Now, genuine faith characterized this great man of God throughout the entirety of his life. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 and 8, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith he obeyed, he trusted, he submitted, he committed himself to the will of God, to the promises of God. By faith he sojourned in a land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Verse 9. And so throughout the land he served, he marched, he obeyed, he worshipped God. And when the Lord appeared to him at Shechem and renewed the promise, he built an altar there. And then passing on between Bethel and Ai, he reared another altar and called upon the name of the Lord. And then after his sad sojourn in the land of Egypt, he returned to this very spot and again offered sacrifice unto God and called upon his name. Melchizedek pronounced a blessing upon Abraham when Abraham returned from the battle of the kings after rescuing Lot. 
And through the long 30 years that went on between the promise that was given to Abraham and the birth of Isaac, his son, Abraham again and again in hope and trust went in unto his wife Sarah in the anticipation of begetting a son in spite of the seemingly impossible circumstances of a barren womb and an aging body. Paul wrote in Romans 4, 18 through 21, of this great man and his faith, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb when he was about a hundred years old. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that God, or that he, was able to fulfill that which he had promised. And so on and on toward the ultimate test of Abraham's great faith, Abraham marched, marched to the tune of the drum of God's command. And finally, he was told to take that son, Isaac, his only son, whom thou lovest, God said, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And by faith, he rose up and went. He did not doubt. He did not question, but he believed that God, in keeping with his promises, was able to raise Isaac from the dead in order to keep that seed promise alive. It was only because God stopped him at the point of that obedient faith as he sought to take the life of his own son that God indeed did stop his hand. And so such is the example of faith and obedience that's before us as heirs of the promise. And this brings us to consider Abraham's justification. Our brother James asked the question, was not our father Abraham justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest then the how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Now, the works of Abraham were said, of course, to be perfected, through which he, he said to be justified, that faith working together with the command of God. We must realize that Abraham's justification, Abraham's faith was not of his own devising as he moved to obey God, as he sought to offer his son upon the altar. Such an act was Contrary to all human reason, God commanded and Abraham obeyed. And due to the deep faith, the deep trust in the heart of Abraham for God, he acted upon the commandment. And thus we see that his faith was such, it is said in the scripture, that it was fulfilled that which God had offered unto Abraham, and Abraham had believed and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Now this was not the first time that Abraham's faith had acted in such a way as it would be said that righteousness would be imputed to him or put down to his account. We find that God in Genesis the 15th chapter in verse 1 appeared to Abraham and said, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. God renewed the promise at this time when Abraham expressed his impatience at its lack of fulfillment. In verse 6, a very, very important passage in understanding the joint connection between faith and obedience, faith and works. It is recorded, and he believed in the Lord, and he counted unto him for righteousness. So again and again, Abraham's faith moved itself in obedience. But the fact remains that righteousness was imputed to him that it was put down to his account. It was not something that was intrinsically Abraham's own. 
It was not a thing of merit. Abraham had not earned it. He was not a sinless, a perfect law keeper. As great a man as he was, the father of the faithful and the friend of God, we find that he indeed did not stand before God by merit. No man ever has, save the sinless son of Almighty God who went to the cross for our sins. Only he is righteous in the absolute and meritorious sense. Now, beloved, there are only two possible ways that we can be justified before God, and that is to be entirely faithful or entirely forgiven. And as we've already suggested to you, no man has ever, outside of Jesus Christ, been entirely faithful to God. Now, the former is by merit, the latter by grace. And so, unless man can live 100% perfectly, 100% of the time, he must look to grace. He must look to God's mercy, his infinite goodness that moves us to repentance, his unmerited favor. Such perfect obedience was not found in the life of Abraham. And so in this sense, Abraham could not be justified before God. But Abraham was justified. His faith was counted unto him for righteousness. He was declared not guilty before God when that faith was reckoned for righteousness. So we find that God's grace came into play in this man's life. This grace was based upon the eventual fulfillment of the very promise that God had made to Abraham in the beginning that through his seed all nations of the earth would be blessed. That seed, of course, is Christ. But the fleshly seed of Abraham, the physical nation that arose from his loins, largely failed to comprehend this truth. They continued to hold on to their own law their own works, their own righteousness. I had the privilege last Thursday evening, for the first time in my life, teaching a group of young people in the Jewish synagogue in Tyler about the Messiah. To start with the book of Genesis and go through the great prophecies and the promise that was given to Abraham, to take them through some of the material that I am giving to you today, and to see them sit there in complete and total silence as though you could hear a pin drop in the room as I spoke of the Christ and I went through his life and I came down to the great day of Pentecost and I gave them the arguments that Peter presented there through the power of the Holy Spirit to prove indeed the fact of his conclusion. And I quoted that conclusion to those young people. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when went on to talk about the church, the community of believers, and how that it was organized, and how that it spread throughout the Roman Empire, and how they too must come to embrace in faith and obedience the Messiah, their own Messiah, if they would be saved. And then for an hour they shot every question at me they could think of. Beloved, it is sad, and it is tragic today, that there are so many that continue to reject God's promise, that they might be heirs. So let's look at Abraham's descendants, two mighty nations, fleshly and spiritual Israel, whereby the plan and promise of God to come from the loins of Abraham, they both would thus be of the seed of Abraham. God, however, willed that the physical be assimilated into the spiritual through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but on a large scale this was not to be. Only a remnant would be saved. It's not, as Paul argued, as though the promise of God or the word of God was weak or failed, but it was because fleshly Israel rejected the plan of God and held on to their law that was given 430 years after the promise to Abraham. It was never the plan of God to make the law of Moses the basis of enabling man to be an heir of righteousness. Due to the weakness of man, as we've already seen, this could not be. It was impossible for man to live 100% of the time perfectly. 
Now, a purely legal system will always leave man in sin, and in their rejection of Jesus, this was what they finally made of the law. Paul argued, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Galatians 3, 10 through 13. Now once a man has violated a single command of God, body of the law in any manner, he cannot be counted under that righteous, under that system. He must look to a Savior. And this is what I told those young people. I said, you have got to look to a Savior. You have got to look to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And boasting on our part is forever excluded from our salvation because we are justified by faith in a Savior without the deeds of the law. Now, the blessedness of which David spoke and is quoted by the Apostle Paul in Romans 4 is this blessedness. Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. God does not put it down to their record based on their surrender to the Christ, to the Son of the living God. Now this blessing was intended for all, circumcised and uncircumcised alike. And Abraham was declared righteous in his uncircumcision that indeed he might be the father of all of them that believe. Paul declared this in Romans 4, 13 through 16. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that which also is the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Praise be to God for that grand fact. I told those young people, I said, if it were not for Jesus Christ, I would sit here before you this night a man without hope. I praise God that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ. The jurisdiction of the law, the covenant God made with Israel was temporary. Paul said it was added because of transgressions until the seed should come to whom the promise was made, Galatians 3 and 19. It pointed out to man his sin, the hideous nature of that sin, and his extreme and terrible need of a savior. The law was that schoolmaster, that pedagogy, or pedagogue to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. And when that faith came, we were dismissed from the care of the law just as the child was dismissed from the care of that schoolmaster that brought them to the teacher, that they indeed might be taught the way. This then causes us to consider Abraham's seed. Though there is definitely a collective sense in which Paul uses the word seed, such as in Romans 4, 13 through 18, the argument in Galatians 3, 16 is an argument based upon the individual. The collective, the great spiritual heritage of Abraham has validity in that it focuses in the individual, in that individual seed, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul said, now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. And he saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Christ really was the means through a, which Abraham himself was justified, had righteousness imputed to him, and to make it possible for all of us to become his children. And so forgiveness of all of our sins, then, is simply the means by which we are justified before God, counted righteous before God, our sins are washed away by God's grace and mercy within the cross of Jesus Christ our Lord. Before
discussing the great example of Abraham's faith and justification in Romans 4, Paul prefaced these truths with the affirmation that Christ Jesus is the grounds of our justification. He said, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who God both set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of them which believe in Jesus. Romans 3, 21 through 26. Those in Christ, the seed of Abraham, were redeemed by the blood of the sinless Son of God who went to the cross for our sins. And we are made the seed or children of Abraham by faith. Paul completed these thoughts in this section in the example of Abraham's justification when he said, Now it was not written for our sakes alone that it was imputed to him for righteousness, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead and was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. It is no wonder, beloved, when Paul ended the great doctrinal section of the Roman letter in the 11th chapter that he built into that grand doxology of praise and he cried out, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out, to whom be glory forever. Amen. So what amazing, what tremendous privilege, what joy is ours as being heirs of the promise of Abraham. But perhaps before we bring our lesson to a close, we need indeed to refine our understanding and look again at our original text. Now, who precisely are Abraham's children or heirs? This is the most profound question of the ages. Webster says, and I quote from him, that an heir is anyone who is legally entitled to inherit another's property or title upon the other's death, either by the provision of a will or by the natural action of the law. Now, of the, a study of the Greek word kleronomos, we find that Kittle says of it, and it does not differ much from the definition that Webster gave it, Quote, in Greek, the word kleronomos circles around the concept of inheritance and never moves very far away from it. Now, we know from Hebrews 9, 15 through 17, that a death has taken place. A will has been drawn up. It has been put into effect to show that God was right and just to pass over those sins in the ages that had gone by and that we know as we examine the last will and testament of Jesus Christ our Lord that God indeed has made it possible for us to be justified. But he has narrowly brought that line or seed line down, his selection and acceptance of the spiritual family, just as he did in the physical sons of Abraham. We find that Paul argued they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, Neither because are they the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of flesh, they are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Esau, it goes to Jacob. Jacob through his wives, he has 12 sons, limited then to Judah. And then finally out of the tribe of Judah, the family of David through whom the promised seed would come. So one is not a child of God today simply because he might observe the law of Moses or he might be a physical descendant of Abraham. Paul made this quite plain in Romans 2 when he said, For he is not a Jew, <clears throat> excuse me, which is one outwardly, 
Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. Beloved, we are circumcised with that circumcision made without hands, buried with him by baptism, raised according to the faith and the operation of God. And so the blessings of Abraham, Paul said, might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. If we are willing to make the same disposition with God's will as was Abraham, submit to it and obey it. In Galatians 3.29, Paul therefore tells us that we are heirs of the promise if we are Abraham's seed. And he goes on to say that we are Abraham's seed if we belong to Christ. Now this is an amplification of what he's been saying in verses 26 through 28. Those who belong to Christ are those who have put on Christ. And he tells us that those who put on Christ are those who have been baptized into Christ. And their being baptized into Christ explains how it is that they have become the children of God through the faith. Four times in four verses here, Paul uses the expression, the faith. In Galatians 3.26, therefore being justified by the faith is what the Greek says. And we need to understand that it is the objective faith, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that produces the subjective faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God that makes it possible for us to be children of God. So if we are heirs that in the seed, that means we belong to Christ. We belong to Christ, we have put on Christ. If we put on Christ, we've been baptized into Christ. And through the faith, we have been made the children of God. And we know that all the promises of God are in him, yea, and in him, amen. We are reconciled unto God in the one body, the church of the living God, through the cross. We have now obtained an inheritance, an inheritance that Peter says is indeed undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for us. Now, there are many responsibilities, blessings, and privileges that I discuss in the book, but you're going to have to look in the book. How that indeed Abraham and Sarah together brought about the kind of atmosphere as she submitted to the headship of Abraham. And Abraham, looking upon his wife as the weaker vessel, indeed did minister unto her. And in that environment, children were commanded that were obedient to God. You know, God has granted to all of us the grace of life. And when we think about that thought, we probably all think about heaven, the life that's there, the life eternal. Beloved, we have promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. I think of our mates. I think of our families, our children and our grandchildren. I think of all the blessings that we have in which Christianity, like a living fountain, has poured the blessings of God over into his people and has created the kind of environment that we so desperately need in order indeed to perfect holiness in the fear of God. Wives were told by Peter to live before their husbands in such a godly, chaste way that they may, without a word upon their part, win their husbands by their godly behavior. All of us that would love life and see good days must refrain our lips from evil that they speak no guile. Eschew evil, do good. For we know that the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. We must seek to live in harmony with one another, learn to be sympathetic, compassionate, humble, and to love each other as brothers. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh. We will not bite and devour one another, but we will in love serve one another because we are the sons of God. And so finally we see that Abraham's reward is our hope. Jesus reveals that the rich man in that life after death looked across the great gulf that separates heirs from the disinherited and those as well that have never been in God's family. And he saw Lazarus and Abraham in bliss. We know that from this, Abraham's faith 
finally brought him to the fullness of the promise. He was looking for a city which hath bound foundation, whose builder and maker was God. And while doing so, he produced a great nation, a messianic seed through whom the whole world has been blessed, and through whom you and I as Gentiles this morning can come into Christ. God prepared for Abraham a heavenly land, and he's not ashamed to be Abraham's God, no ours, because we belong to Christ, because we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise.